Praise the Lord. This is kind of different, isn't it? I, I don't know if I'll be able to see over y'all. But um, happy are you if you do them. This is called Servant of Servants. And Servant of Servants is the title of a chapter from The Desire of Ages. And we like to read that before we have, well, just before we're getting ready to have fellowship um, as in communion service. So I have read it several times. But um, I won't ask a show of hands for how many of you have read it several times. But it's very possible you have not. So at some point, I'm going to be reading a lot of, uh, from that chapter, okay? But just before we start, I'm going to have one more prayer for us, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of standing before your people and for the privilege, Lord, of offering your word back to you, asking you to plant it in our hearts, change us, make us who you want us to be. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. John chapter 13, you might want to open up that in your own Bible. I'm going to read from the King James Version. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, talks to us about what was going on before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And one of the things that ways that he's going to show them that he loves them is that even during this Passover meal, he's going to do things for them that he would not have done if he didn't love them so very much. So let's look at that. And supper being ended, wow, look at that word devil, D-E-V-I-L. The devil, having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, to betray Jesus. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Jesus, in this verse, is fully aware of his what? His divinity, we would say, wouldn't we? Of his Godhead. He's fully aware of where he's come from. A lot of people spend a lot of time in life trying to figure out you know, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going to? What's, what's the purpose of life? Is there a purpose to life? But Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and he went to God. What a reassurance that was fixed in his heart. And what did the devil challenge him with when he was in the temptation? If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. If thou be the Son of God, Make these stones into bread, and if thou be the Son of God, if, if, the badge of doubt. But Jesus knew who he was, and he knew where he was going, and he knew where he came from. Do you know who you are, and do you know where you're going? If you know where you're going, raise your hand. All right? If you know where you're going, raise your hand. You know, I have on my Facebook page a little thing that says that I'm a... Um, uh, exile, I'm an expat from New Jerusalem. My real hometown is New Jerusalem, and I'm just a uh, passing through. You know, this world is not my home. I'm, uh, it's, it's not my home. And if it's your home, well, I feel sorry for you because it's not going to be much better. But we are getting the New Jerusalem, and that will come down from heaven. So that's the good news about that. But here's this old devil. He comes. He's got it in the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. And so Jesus does an amazing thing, and this is an act of love. He rises from supper, lays aside his garments, and takes a towel, and he girds himself with his towel, and then he pours that water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. A girdle is something you wrap around your waist or your hips. And so this thing that he had around his hips, he uses it to wipe their feet. There's a foot drying service in Jesus's, uh, in Jesus's foot washing also. And that is very beautiful. You suppose he drives between the toes? You suppose he goes up by the ankle? You suppose he thinks beautiful things when he's touching their feet? You suppose he's saying, these feet walked with me for these three and a half years. 
and they're still sitting around the table arguing about who's the greatest. These feet walked with me, and nobody volunteered to be a servant to wash the feet. I don't know what Jesus thought, but I know that, thank God, he knew that he came from God and that he was going to God, because that would have uh, cheered him up in, a, in spite of the grief. The next thing that we're going to read is verse 6 of that same chapter, John 13. Then comes he to Simon Peter. So Jesus is washing feet, and he gets to Simon Peter. And Peter says, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? I don't know, maybe Peter's afraid that his water's going to look black like mine did when I stuck those uh, suede shoes in there, suede dyed feet. But Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. What I'm doing, you don't know, you don't know what you don't understand it right now, but you're going to understand it a little bit later. But Peter says to him, You're never gonna wash my feet. Why does Peter say that? Why does Peter say, You're not gonna wash my feet? It's like as if the President of the United States comes and he says, uh, let me tie your shoes. Or, you know, the President of the United States with all of his secret service and all the glamour. Or the Queen that just passed away. All the things that happened. Or a King that just happened. And they say, let me go ahead and cut your toenails for you. Oh my goodness, I don't think so. I, 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 I can't think about it. You, you're too grand to, to reach down and touch. You haven't seen my feet. You know, I got these crooked toes and I got these toenails. Mm. Jesus says, Peter is, is, is saying, Lord, you, you will never wash my feet. Jesus had never touched his feet before. People don't touch each other's feet very much, except for in this, in this particular society where they did a lot of washing. I saw um, a video of uh, trying to reenact the, the first century where they would come in the house and there's a little bowl there and there's a little rag there. And, person before they went the rest of the house, you know, they took the water, wiped off their feet, and, and a lot of people's houses, you know, you kick off your shoes before you're allowed to come in. Well, I have plantar fasciitis. I did that at one person's house, and I couldn't walk for the rest of the time I was there because they had those hard tile floors. And so I kind of beg off of, can I, can I keep my shoes on when I come to your house? Otherwise, I might not be able to walk out. Um, it, it, it came and went, but, but, in uh, lots of places, if you don't kick off your shoes, you're very disrespectful. And so bringing bare feet into this room means that they needed to be tended to. The dirty sandals were left behind, but the bare feet were still dirty. There was supposed to be somebody there that would wash somebody's feet, and it was, I mean, it's not, it's like sort of like that summer that I was a, a lifeguard, and it, it rained, and so they were paying us, and so they said, well, instead, we want you to go paint the um, toilet seats in the toilet in the, in the big restroom area. I was a lifeguard. I was even on cleaning toilets in the toilet seats. I, uh, was that work beneath me? Well, not really, because they were still paying me, but it wasn't what I signed up for. And these servants that were washing feet, it was a bit of a job, you know, whoever was going to do it. Well, the disciples were going to find out. None of them planned on doing it. None of them did it, which is why Jesus had to do it. But Peter's really proud, and he's saying, you're never going to wash my feet. But then Jesus says to him, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part of me. You're not, you're not part of who I am and what I'm doing. If I, if I can't wash your feet... You don't belong to me. You have no part in me, with me. And so then Simon Peter, oof, he sees an opportunity. He says, well then, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. You know, he wants the whole works. Simon Peter is one of those all or nothing guys. He goes, whip him from one, whip him from one, <coughs> one at all or one none of it, right? And right there he does that. Because he's got a heart, he understands that he's not going to have a part of Jesus because he's not going to let Jesus wash his feet. Then do, do everything then, Lord. Thank God Jesus had an explanation for this. And Jesus said, He that is washed needs not saved, needs not, yeah, needeth not saved to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. So I guess the point is, Lynn, if, if you get 
all cleaned up. And then you walk across your floor, and if your floor is like mine, I always tell people, keep your shoes on, you don't want to get your feet dirty coming in the house. But not your house, but my house. And so you walk across the floor, and all right, there's some sand from the beach. Now your feet have sand. The way you took, got all clean, you had, in the Song of Solomon, the lady says she doesn't want to get out of bed. She says, I've already, I've already washed my feet, I'm already in bed. I don't want to get out and get sand on my feet, and I'm bringing the sand back in the bed. That's what's in the Song of Solomon, the way I read it. And this is the same thing. Jesus is saying that if you're washed and you're clean, all you gotta do is just take care of your feet before you're all the way clean. But not all. And so he uses the word physically clean, and I'll talk about spiritual uncleanness. And that spiritual uncleanness is for he knew who should betray him. Therefore, he said, ye are not all clean. So now we're figuring out that this is not just about dirty feet. This thing that Jesus is doing is not just about whether your feet are clean enough to come into this banquet hall. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, so he put some more things back on, and he sat down again, he says to them, Know ye what I have done to you. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, it's good that you're calling me Master and Lord, because so I am. He's recognizing and telling them, yes, I am your Lord, I am your Master. And he said, if then I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, Ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Okay, we're still talking about feet here. So Jesus has washed their feet. He reminds them that I'm your Lord and Master. Well, is there anything higher than Lord or Master? I'm your high up. I'm your higher power. I'm your higher up. I'm your superior officer. I am whom you report to. And there's nobody above me who report who I report to, except the Father. And so Jesus is saying, this is who I am, and I've washed your feet. <coughs> Shouldn't you do the same thing for each other's feet? There's going to be a beautiful lesson here. He says, for I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, unless we get the lesson of humility here, we don't really get the lesson. But we're going to read about that in the uh, passage, Servant of Servants. So I'm going to skip by a little. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. You know, the, the Amazon person who brings me my package, I'm very thankful for him, but they're not Jeff Bezos who created Amazon that I got on my app and went ahead. You know, he's just a servant of the Amazon company and he brings stuff to me. He's not greater than the guy who <coughs> made the company that's bringing me my stuff. The servant is not greater than his Lord and neither is he that sent greater than he that sent him. And then he says, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Well, the last thing he told him is that, that, that if I have washed your feet, you should wash each other's feet. So that must be what he's referring back to. In the New King James, it says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And in the New Living Translation, it says, now that, they, that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. There's a whole lot of people that skip communion. As if it's in the bulletin that there's going to be communion, they go, man, I don't want to be any part of that uh, First of all, this church washes feet, and even though I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, this church washes feet, I'm not sure I want to come to the communion because they have this foot washing thing before they get around to the communion, so I'll just wait for the short sermon and I'll skip out the back door. And what are they losing? What have I ever lost if I did that? Well, Jesus said that I would have lost the, the blessing. I would have lost the blessing that God will bless you for doing that. Happy are you if you do them. <coughs> Blessed are you if you do them. So we got to do these things that Jesus is asking us to do. By the way, if you're happy, inform your face, because a lot of you have got these almost going to sleep eyes. 
<laughs> so I ask everybody to stand up for a second and get refreshed. <coughs> All right, raise your hands over your head and just go like this for me for a second. This is not Pentecostal. This is uh, to show me that you're really good. All right. This is an amazing picture, though. You can hardly see it because um, our projector doesn't do as well as uh, an LED screen would do, but that's neither here nor there. The guy has blue jeans on, doesn't he? He's got blue jeans on. He's got a t-shirt on. And yet we've got Jesus pouring out water on his feet. This is for you and me for today. This is not just something that was supposed to be in the Old Testament or New Testament. Isaiah 52 is the song that we sang, came from this verse. And there was a man that came. He was a preacher. We were in Oregon a long time ago, and he came and taught about the Lord's Supper. And he said, when you're washing feet, and I took it personally, he said, I want you to speak a blessing over people's feet. Speak a blessing over them. Tell them how beautiful their feet are. And, and quote this verse. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace, that brings good news. Usually I only get as far as how beautiful are the feet upon the mountain, and I forget the rest of it. But I like to say the scripture, and he, and he advises, say, quote scripture over people when you're um, washing their feet. And that's a beautiful thing to do. I never forgot it. That brings good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that says unto Zion, Thy God reigns. And when you talk about the word reign, it means he's king and he's, he's in charge. And everything that's going on, he knows what's going on. Your God is reigning. And then in Romans chapter 3, <coughs> verse 15, Paul quotes that Isaiah chapter. He says, And how shall they preach? except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. In Ephesians chapter 6, the um, uh, 14 through 16, this is the full armor of God. He says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with what? Read it to me, folks. Let's read this whole thing. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and have you on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked well if you were a farrier and put on horseshoes you'd know that the word shod means to put on a shoe on a horse and so paul is saying to have your feet got some horseshoes with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And you know, if you're not prepared with the gospel of peace, you don't know how to do it. That's why we have Bible tracts. That's why we have little pieces of paper that talk about the gospel. And you have them in your purse, you have them in your pocket, and you're able to pass them out. You're prepared to share the gospel of peace. If you have the preparation of the gospel of peace. What's peaceful about it? Well, the peaceful part about it is this, that God, when Jesus was born, sent the whole crew of angels, and what they say, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth to men of good will. God's making peace with the fallen human race of Adam. So, we have the gospel of peace, the gospel of reconciliation. And it's like, it's on our feet. Get your feet ready to share because you're going and you're preaching and you're sharing. Now the Lord Jesus Christ bore this cross on to Calvary. There were already two thieves on the cross. So just before he's getting ready to do this for us, he's talking to his disciples. And his disciples are receiving the gift. It's an object lesson of Jesus washing their feet. He is loving them even to the end and showing them because this object lesson is going to change their minds about who's the greatest. In the Sermon of Servants, uh, I think it's chapter 71, if you open up your own uh, Bible or <coughs> your own app, you can find it. On um, page 273, uh, paragraph 5, no man who makes any reserve, reserve means holding back. You know, you hold back something, you got a company coming, and you know that three people are going to be late, so you put three pieces of cake or pie uh, on the reserve, so that when they get there, there's something for them. 
But this means no man who makes any reserve can be the disciple of Christ. You can't hold back. You can't have this part is for set aside for me and 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 God, you can have, you know, three I got three tenths, you got seven tenths, and we're gonna do it like that. No man who makes any reserve can be the disciple of Christ, much less can he be his co-laborer. When men appreciate the great salvation, the self-sacrifice seen in Christ's life, when men appreciate the great salvation, the self-sacrifice seen in Christ's life will be seen in theirs, in their life. Wherever he leads the way, they will rejoice to follow the sacrifice. We have to be reminded of his physical pain to know the sacrifice, that the Son of God came down from his heavenly court to dwell amongst people that were hating him a whole lot of the time, didn't appreciate who he was or what he was doing. And if we can't appreciate that part, we can at least appreciate the sacrifice that he made on the cross. So in Luke 22, verse 21 and 23, remember <coughs> Judas, the devil, came into him and he was the one that was going to betray Jesus. But behold, the hand of him that betrays me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves, which of them it should be that you do this thing. And there was also a strife among them, which should be the account of the greatest. They were still having this argument. Each one of them thought they should be the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. You get the, re you re I know, benefactors. Those are the people that you get the blessings from. And the Bible says that the lesser is blessed of the greater. And Jesus is going to show us who's the greater. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For what is greater, he that sits at meat or food, or he that serves, is not he that sits at meat or food, but I am among you as he that serves. So when you go to a restaurant, you're the one that's going to pay for it. Are you expected to be, to be, I mean, I'm always nice to my server, but the point is that the server is there working for you. And that's what this is saying. Who's the greater? The one that sits down at the table getting ready to eat? Or the one that's standing up wait, waiting on you to see what you need and serving you? Well, Jesus is telling you it's the one that's sitting down that's having a meal is the greater one. He says, but I am among you as one that serves. I'm here like as if I was your waiter, as if I was your server. And he says to his disciples, these that are sitting around getting ready to have this Passover meal, you are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Jesus had a lot of things that happened to him, the Pharisees always knocking him down. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father has appointed unto me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He's talking to those twelve that are sitting there. So Christ expressed his love for his disciples. Their selfish spirit filled him with sorrow, but he entered into no controversy with them regarding their difficulty. Instead, he gave them an example they would never forget. His love for them was not easily disturbed or quenched. He knew that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he came from God and went to God. He had a full consciousness of his divinity. But he laid aside his royal crown and kingly robes and had taken on the form of a servant all the time that he was with them. One of the last acts of his life on earth was to gird himself as a servant and perform a servant's part. Here we see it in this image that Jesus is being the servant of those disciples. In his life and lessons, Christ had given a perfect 
exemplification of the unselfish ministry which had its origin in God. God does not live for himself. By creating the world and by upholding all things, he is constantly ministering for others. He makes his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. And if you read that, that verse, it says, Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. He makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. We are not to be um, discriminating who we're going to share this gospel with. We're not supposed to say, well, I don't think that that person over there is really you know, going to ever get it. We've had some people on the cruise that we shared the gospel with, but, and um, I, I'm still praying for those two young ladies that shared a room together. This ideal of ministry God has committed to his son. What ideal of ministry? The ideal that you're always serving Jesus was to stand at the head of humanity that by his example he might teach what it means to minister. His whole life was under a law of service. He served, ministered to all. Jesus, he lived the law of God and by his example showed how we are to obey it. Again and again, Jesus had tried to establish this principle among his disciples, and when James and John made their request for preeminence, he had said, Whosoever will be great among you, will let him be your minister, let him be your servant. Matthew 20, verse 26, My kingdom, in my kingdom, the principle of preference and supremacy has no place. Preference and supremacy. Who am I to judge another man's servant, Paul said? It's not my job to figure out whether you're doing what Jesus asked you to do. It's not your job to figure out whether anybody else is doing what Jesus asked them to do. The only greatness is the greatness of humility, she goes on to say. The only distinction is found in devotion to the service of others. And now, having washed the disciples' feet, he said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. And in these words, Christ was not merely enjoining the practice of hospitality. More was meant than the washing of the feet of guests to remove the dust of travel. Christ was here instituting a religious service. By the act of our Lord, this humiliating ceremony was made a consecrated ordinance. This humiliating ceremony like I said, it's not normal to wash other people's feet. Mm -hmm. Not in our society. And obviously not too much in theirs. Because none of the disciples jumped up to take the job over from Jesus, even though they could see how sorrowful he was. And that grief made them a little tender for a little bit, but then they went back to thinking, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we can I really want that position of prime minister. And I'm, I'm thinking that you should be the chief treasurer. And uh, let's see, you can be captain of the guard. And, and then this guy over here, I really have never admired his ministry. I think that he's probably just going to be a tag along. I'm not sure what position we're going to give him when Jesus comes in his kingdom. They had all these self, selfish desires for placement. So, and I like that word. What was it? Supremacy? Uh, in my kingdom, the principle of preference and supremacy has no place. You know, the principles of democracy and equality, that all men are created equal, are right in the place when Jesus is washing the feet. So it's in these words, it's not just hospitality, but now this humiliating ceremony has made a consecrated ordinance. An ordinance is something that as a church we're supposed to do. And um, it was to be observed by the disciples, that they might ever keep in mind his, Jesus' lessons of humility and service. Could they ever forget that Jesus has washed their feet? Could they ever forget that they had said to themselves, I'm not going over there and become a fat fool and kind of start washing these guys' feet. Somebody else is going to have to do it. I'm not going to do it. They all said that in their heart. Because if they each hadn't said that, then Jesus wouldn't have been the last one to do it. 
Nobody got up to wash feet except Jesus, and he waited. But it was to be observed by the disciples that they might ever keep in mind his lessons of humility and service. This ordinance is Christ's appointed preparation for the sacramental service, for the time when we take of the um, grape juice and the bread, which is the body and the blood of Jesus, which is part of our salvation, part of us understanding our salvation, what it cost God to buy us back. 